Okay. And uh, she got a, <coughs> Jenny got an 86 on her test. Okay. And maybe you want to write some of this down or maybe take some notes or something like that. But um, she got an 86 on the test. And you want to know how she did. Is that good or is that bad? Well, if you think like an 86, that's pretty good, right? Because it's above a, as long as you get a, a B, that's okay. But sometimes you want a different measure, like when you take the ACT or something, right? You want to know how you compare to others who also took the ACT, right? You want to know if you're in the 70th percentile, the 80th percentile, the 90th percentile, or 99th or whatever, okay? And so the way you can figure out that is, one way you can figure that out is using percentiles. So this is called, we already talked about this, this is a, a uh, stem plot. And uh, this is Jenny's score right here. She got an 86, right? And so, so if you want to figure out, there were 25 students in her class, if you want to figure out what her percentile is, this is how you do it, okay? And it says percentile is the uh, percentile of a distribution is a value with p per with p percent of the observations less than. Okay, so if you say I'm in the 89th percentile, that means 89 percent of the students did worse than you did. So that's pretty good. If you're in the second percentile, is that good or bad? That's bad because only 2% of the students did worse than you, right? So that percentile means how many are below that value. So if you want to uh, compute Jenny's percentile, who got an 86, you don't do anything with the 86. You just figure out what um, number she is in this plot. So if you count up, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So she's the 22nd person out of 20. She's ranked three from the top, or she's the 20. So how many are below her if she's 22 in this list out of 25? So there's 21 below. So the way you would calculate her percentile is just by going 21 out of the total, which is 25 are behind her, multiplying that by 100, and you would get that Jenny is in the 84th percentile, okay? That's all there is to percentile. How many of you knew that already? Okay, some of you, but not all. Can it, is it possible to be in the 100th percentile? No. Why not? Because you'd have to Sam. be higher than yourself. It's always n minus 1. Right, it's always the people lower than you. So you can be in the 99.9th percentile, but you can't be in the 100th percentile. Can you put your phone away, please? Thank you. All right, so uh, um, they, I guess they do sometimes compute percentiles are less than or equal to, but for our purposes, percentiles <coughs> should be uh, less than, okay? So uh, what about um, why don't um, what what would a percentile of a student scoring seventy seven be? So if you look at this, how would I figure that out? Seventy seven. Where would that be in this stem plot? See all those sevens? Seventy seven, seventy seven, seventy seven. So when you have repeated values. You look at all the numbers that are below. So you don't have to worry about the repeated seven. So below seven, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six people, right? Below, um, below seven. So be below all those 77s. So it'll be six out of 25. So if you scored a 77, even though you might have passed the test, you would be in the, uh, in the what percentile? 24th percentile, 6th out of 24th percentile. So even if you scored a 77, you're not ranking that high, you know? So, so uh, that's that, okay? Questions about percentile, how to do it? Is that easy? Easy? Okay. So uh, the next thing they talk about in here 
is something called a cumulative relative frequency graph. And this is useful for um, figuring out it like where, where you rank again. It's another way of looking at how people are ranked. And, and so this is or where you stand within a group of stuff. So this is US presidents. And uh, there are some interesting graphs. So for instance, here's a frequency table that summarizes the ages of the first 44 US pre presidents when they were inaugurated. Okay, so, so these are presidents. I think you have to be some certain age to be president. How old do you have to be, 30? No, I don't 30. think you can Yeah, I think you do. You have to be like 35 or something. And I think you have to have a law degree, too. Okay, so uh, I can be present. And too much stress. And so, um, so, uh, so this, is, this is a frequency table. 40 out of 44. Um, 40 to 44. Um, there were two presidents who were inaugurated when they were uh, between 40 and 44. And then seven between 45 and 49 and 50, I mean 13 between 50 and 54. And then to make a graph of this, one thing you can do is make a, uh, let's move this out of the way for now, what's called a uh, cumulative relative frequency table. And what cumulative means is you add them up as you go. Okay, so here's um, the first two presidents, or the first two presidents were 40 to 44. And then seven presidents were 45 to 49. So you take those new two numbers, two plus five, and you get nine, right? And then you take nine, um, nine plus 13, and that gives you 22. And 22 plus 12 gives you 34. And 34 plus seven gives you 41. Get that? Okay. Yes. Girls. No one needs to take any notes. You can just sit here and look out the window and everything and chat while I'm teaching. And I, I, know, I, I know, but uh, I'm kind of explaining it to you. I have to teach you something. All right? So um, that because I know that I look at the book, and I have to read it through a couple times before I understand exactly what's being, what they're trying to get across. So it's not like you can just, it's kind of easy I think if you read through it and have someone explain what is going on, that's what I'm trying to do. You guys? Okay, so then um, with this, there's 44 total uh, presidents who are inaugurated. Okay? So 2 out of 44 means you have a cumulative relative frequency. A relative frequency is in percents. So you take that 2 out of 44 and you get 4.5%. Then you take this cumulative number and you divide that into 44 and you get this and you end up getting 100% of all the people who were nominated. And so what happens when you make the graph okay, is you, uh, if, if this is the graph right here, you start with, you start at zero and it's they kind of have a little bump here just so it doesn't start right here at the at, at zero zero so it starts up here at um, from zero to 45 from 40 to 45 if you go back there were whoops there were two presidents nominated 40 to 44 right and so that's where this little dot comes from it and and then this is people from 45 to uh, 49 when they were nominated. So you're just adding up. <coughs> you're just adding up. You don't have. You're just plotting these percentages. Okay. So here's your 20.5. Here's your 50. Here's your 77. Here's your 93. And here's your 100 up to 100 percent. Right. And so all the people should be accounted for by the time you get to there. Okay, so if you look at this graph, you should be able to tell some things without even looking at the table. So in what, at what ages, just by looking at the graph, were the most U.S. presidents inaugurated? At what ages? In what age group? 
How could you tell that, calculus students? How could you tell by looking at the graph? We could, okay? You can see where it's the steepest, right? Because this is kind of a calculus related problem. See how it's steepest right here? That means that there were the most, that the, the graph went up the most, means that the most presidents were nominated in this, or inaugurated, sorry, inaugurated in this age group. And then kind of the second most over here. And then you can see that not too many presidents were inaugurated over 65, right? Where else were not too many presidents inaugurated? At what ages? 40 to 45. Between 40 to 45. So, okay. So, uh, that's that cumulative show the graph. What can you do? What's the range? When do most presidents? We talked about okay, that. So, wait. Um, can, I, can I ask like, a question? Yes, sir. So, on a, for like relative frequency, if you were to graph that out, you would use uh, like a bar graph or a histogram type of thing, right? If you what? So if you were to graph the relative frequency. Yeah. But for the cumulative relative frequency, you have that kind of graph. Yeah, line graph because you want to show it and it adds up to 100%. Okay. So if uh, President Obama, let say Obama was nominated when he was 47, which is quick path, okay? Obama was 47, how do you spell Obama? Like that, okay? He was 47 when he got inaugurated. How can I tell what percentile he would be in from just by looking at that graph? How can I? Yeah, so you, so you look for 47, okay? So, uh, so it, you could take a line, I would take a line, and go up from uh, 47, about, so I guess 47 be about here, right? Let's not put, oh, I don't want arrows on the end. That does. And then uh, I go across, okay? And so how many people get inaugurated approximately lower than or younger than 47%? I mean, younger than 47. What percent of presidents are are nominated when they're younger than about 10 percent. You can look at the graph, and so, so this since it's cumulative, right? Up to this point, about 10 percent of the presidents were nominated in this age group. So he's in the what percentile? What percentile would he be in? The 10 percentile, right? How about what if you? What age would you be if you were in the 90th percentile? Say you're in the 90th percentile. About what age would you have to be if you're in the 90th percentile? How would I figure that out? Well, you'd draw a line. You'd kind of take a line. You'd come up here to 90. You'd go across like that. And then you go down. And you say, well, probably if you're in the 90th percentile, you'd have to be around 64 or 65 years old. Get that? Yes? Okay. Um, makes sense. What else? Uh, so then let's just look at another one that they have, and the answers aren't in the book here, so I would like to do these with you. So here's a graph of, what is this a graph of? Cell phone calls, okay? And it says about what percent of these calls lasted less than 30 minutes. So how would I figure that out? Just the same way I did before, okay? So I go up here, I go across, and you'd say about 60%. Estimate Q1, Q3, and the IQR for, of this distribution just by looking at the graph, okay? So if it's Q1, what percent of people are below that? 25. 25%, right? So you would look, so you'd uh, go here, right? And uh, so you'd look for 25, I don't know where 25, if this is 30, then maybe 25 is about here, okay? And then you'd kind of go down like this. So what would you say that is about 13 or something? 13, okay? And then Q3, about what percent are below Q3? 
about 75 because Q3 is the last, above Q3 is the last 25%. So if you go across and down, okay, then you get that, I don't know, maybe that's about 33 or something. So maybe 33 is Q3. And maybe 13 is Q1. So the IQR is Q3 minus Q1, which would give you about 20. See how you could do that by interpreting the graph? So that's that. Okay? That's pretty cool, huh? Um, phone call question. Look, I'm almost done. Z scores. Next thing. Um, so the next thing that they talk about is Z scores. And a z-score is just a measure, it's a, called a standardized score. And instead of saying the standard deviation is this, and you score this, all a z-score is is how many standard deviations above or below the mean are you, okay? So are you within, a, are you in, in, are you within one standard deviation, whereas most, whereas usually where most of the data falls, but if you're outside of one uh, standard deviation, then either could mean you're very high or very low. Okay, so uh, Jenny's score was 86, and they said that the standard deviation is about six. Um, and so to find the z-score, what you do is you take your value, in this case Jenny, who got an 86. The mean, um, they said in this problem, was uh, they took the mean and it was 80, okay? And then they did the calculation and you could use your calculator to find the standard deviation and the standard deviation of those scores in her stats class came out to be 6.07, uh, 6 okay? And so, so, uh, so that comes out to be about one. So a z-score of about one means that you are one standard deviation away from the mean. Okay. So as we get to the bell-shaped curve, normal curves, and stuff like that, something that somewhere around here Jenny would fall, uh, and we'll talk about percentages. I think in the next chapter, maybe later on in this chapter. Okay, um, what about, they have this guy, and his name is Norman. Norman, and Norman scored a 72. How would I find his z-score? 72 minus 80, um, divided by 6.07. And so Norman has a z-score, a negative z-score of negative 1.37, okay? And uh, that's kind of bad if you're more than one standard deviation below the mean, right? So if you're taking the ACT or something, do you know what the mean ACT score is? You guys know about like 22. 22? I don't know. Oh. I don't know, but what's the best you can do? Like 36 or something? 36. I took it SATs when I was in high school. But, um, but yeah, if you're like 22, maybe your zero standard deviation. I don't know what the standard deviation is, but we can look it up and see, okay? And then uh, last problem, um, Mr. Navard's statistics class has just completed the three steps of the where do I stand activity. They, we do a little, they did a little stand up thing to see where you are as far as your heights. Lynette, a student in the class is 65 inches tall. Find and interpret her z-score. So they give you a bunch of data here, okay? So Lynette is right here. That must be Lynette, right? And um, let's figure out her z-score. So how would I, who could tell me how to do that? How would I figure out Lynette's z-score? Okay, so what's the mean? What's the mean? 67. 67, so I'm gonna go 65 minus 67 and divide it by the standard deviation, which is 4.29. And so I get that Lynette's uh, z-score is, uh, oh, what is Lynette's z-score? 
you'd have to do that and figure it out, right? So, what'd you get? About negative 0.48. Okay, so about negative 0.48. You're just guessing? Oh, because it's 2 divided by somewhere around it, okay? And then another class, 74, how to compare with the Brent. So it's, this is kind of going backwards a little bit. So Brent is a member of the school's basketball team. The mean height of the players on the team is 76. Brent's height translate to a Z, translates to a z-score of negative 0.85 in the team's height distribution. What is the standard deviation of the team members' heights? Okay. So how would you figure this at 4.6? Thank you, Tyler. 0.46, right? Yeah. 0.46. So this means she's half of the standard deviation about below the mean. How can I set up this problem? Grant's a member of the school's basketball te team. The mean height of the players on the team is 76. Grant's height translates to a z-squared at negative 0.85 in the team's height. What is the standard deviation? <coughs> Last one. <coughs> Not that hard. So you just plug everything in and do the Yeah, you just plug in, except you don't know the standard deviation on the bottom. Okay, so you have, you know that um, he is, how tall is he? The mean height of the players on the team is 76. So you're going to subtract his height from there. Oh, here's Brent over here. He's 74. 74 minus 76 divided by, in this case, they use this symbol for standard deviation because you know all of the members of the basketball team. It's not a sample, it's all of the people. But, um, and then you get that that number is negative 0.85, okay? And then you can just solve that algebraically, multiply both sides by sigma and divide, and you get that uh, that's equal to 74 minus 76, which is negative two. Divide it by negative 0.85. And if you do that out, you get that. Um, bum, ba, dum. Oh, you, oh, maybe it's on the next page. You get that is red. We do this. Solve for sigma. So we find that sigma is 2.85 inches. Okay? Um, homework. There it is. I'm done. You may. Uh, Yes, I